if you want to talk about prominent VCs, right, showing an appetite or willingness to be in this market, Mercury Bank and Substack, two Andreessen Horowitz-backed companies, both did community rounds, basically at the same terms as Andreessen had done at. Welcome to VC Evolve podcast, conversations about the future of VC. Today, our guest is Chris Lestrino, managing partner at King's Crowd Capital and founder and CEO of King's Crowd. King's Crowd Capital or KC Capital is described as the first data-driven VC fund for the online private market. Let's start with this description, Chris. What is an online private market and how is it different from the traditional private market? Well, first off, Ahmed, thank you so much for having me on your podcast today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And it's a great question. At the very heart of it, what is the online private markets? Well, traditionally, up until the mid 2015, somewhere between 2015 and 2020, the traditional way of doing any really private market transaction was to do it offline. And by offline, it's literally what it sounds like. It's to not do it on the internet, right? It's to use paper and send wires and do everything by hand. And that was the traditional way of doing private equity, venture capital investing. And then thanks to kind of new technology that's come about, what I talk about is securitization and fractionalization of securities. And all I really mean by that is there are now digital structures to create securities so that you can list them online. And fractionalization, all that means is we now have the ability to take, whether it be an asset or a company, and split it into many, many, many small pieces. So, you know, if you think of an entire company being 100%, you can sell one one thousandth of a percent, right? You could sell tiny, tiny pieces. And by both of those things becoming possible, it's basically created this opportunity to take offline transactions and bring them online into the digital world. So now, instead of doing things in kind of the old traditional way and it being kind of hand-to-hand combat and going and winning deals offline amongst your own network, you can raise capital as a private company from literally anyone in the world, really. And so what's emerged over the past six or seven years now is this whole new industry that we define as the online private markets, which essentially allows anybody to invest into private companies, of which there are thousands and thousands a year raising capital from the general public. And it's taking those offline transactions and making them seamless and easy to invest in, just like investing in a stock out of Robinhood. And Chris, when you say anybody, do you mean not accredited investors as well? That's exactly right. Yep. So we're talking about 100% of Americans can now invest into private companies and private real estate deals that were traditionally only allowed for the accredited investors who were millionaires, not including their own home, which only represents about 3% of society. And do you have any numbers for us on uh, how many or how much money is invested in those companies? How many companies actually go to this route and instead of the traditional venture capital route? There's really three regulations that enable you to raise capital online. Essentially, what the SEC said is, listen, if we're going to open up the private capital markets and make it a more mainstream asset class, there needs to be some rules in place. So they did put structures in place. There's three key structures, regulation crowdfunding, regulation A+, and regulation D506C. Regulation crowdfunding allows you to raise up to $5 million per year from anybody, and you have to file two years of audited financials through something called a Form C. The Form C is a relatively easy thing, relatively light lift, but you are disclosing real information about the business. Regulation A+, plus, you can raise up to $75 million. It's a much more intensive process, tends to be more growth stage, late stage companies that have the resources to build out really in-depth legal paperwork that gets filed with the SEC, including tons of financials and terms and all sorts of stuff. And then there's Regulation D506C, which actually only allows you to raise from accredited investors, but you can solicit and advertise online to other accredited investors who you might not know. Across those three regulations, we've seen billions and billions of dollars pour into thousands and thousands of companies. Now, the the way that people most get excited about raising capital online is through regulation crowdfunding, just because it's the one that allows you to raise from anyone, allows you to raise up to $5 million, and is a relatively light lift. Within that category, we're seeing hundreds of millions of dollars invested per year across about 2,000 deals per year. 
And that's up from when I started this business in 2018, you know, we saw sub $100 million invested into about maybe 100 companies. And now we're seeing 2,000 plus companies per year and hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars. We're on a path where we should see that annual number be well over a billion dollars over the next few years. Under Regulation A+, plus, we're literally seeing three to four billion dollars a year go into private companies, which is really impressive. And then under Regulation D506C, which again is only accredited, we're seeing billions and billions of dollars because people realize, hey, if I can raise from a broader pool of people, that will likely lead to better success than not doing it from a broader pool of people. So there's quite a bit of activity in the market, to say the least. This is awesome news for startups. They have a new path now. It's not only the traditional path where you have to go to angels and then VCs and then negotiate the valuations with those VCs, and they will have control in your company and sit on your board. There's now another path for startups. But what about VCs, the VC firms themselves? Can they utilize the crowdfunding regulations? Yeah, if they're smart, they will. We are seeing a growing number of firms be open to it, both investing in the companies via the platforms, sourcing deal flow from the platforms, and lastly, actually having their portfolio companies go and do raises from the public. And I'll, I'll give you, you know, Two examples, whether they're the best companies or not, doesn't really matter. If you want to talk about prominent VCs, right, showing an appetite or willingness to be in this market, Mercury Bank and Substack, two Andreessen Horowitz-backed companies, both did community rounds, basically at the same terms as Andreessen had done at. And the reason that they did those, because one, they believe that doing community rounds is really powerful as a way to engage your, your community, your, your customers, your audience. Both of those sold out, you know, extremely quickly. I believe Mercury had o- over 17 million in interest. They could only accept five and they accepted it from their customers first. So we're seeing that growing adoption and willingness uh, to back companies that are uh, doing these community rounds online. And can VC firms raise money for their funds or firms through the crowdfunding regulations? Yeah, it's a great question. So currently, and it's a very unfortunate rule, and I do think we'll see it be changed here in the coming years. When the Jobs Act was created, VCs actually feared non-accredited investors coming into the space and being able to invest in funds. Why they felt that way is still kind of beyond me. But because they felt that way, The way the regulation was written was venture funds are very risky, so we shouldn't allow non-accredited investors to invest in them. They should only be able to make direct investments, which is just completely illogical, uh, but that is actually how the regulation is written. So right now, you can't raise for a fund, unfortunately, to non-accredited investors. Now, what you can do is you can raise capital via Reg D 506C from accredited investors. Angelus is likely the far and away the largest platform. It's actually the platform we use at King's Crowd Capital to raise and manage our fund. So you can raise from the public. It's just you are still limited to accredited investors only. The one caveat to that is that you can raise for essentially a holding company that's going to purchase a company, almost like a SPAC in a way, but in the private markets, you can say we are going to buy and own a majority stake in two or three companies. If you're essentially going to be buying operational companies that you you basically own, then you can kind of raise a fund, but they look at it as operational capital to buy businesses. And so there's a little bit of a loophole there, but it's not a traditional fund by any means. It's more, it's almost like a, a search fund for a private equity firm. Awesome. Now, if I move to another topic, many VCs say that they are data driven, but reality is it's really hard to get data about private companies. And you say that the fund, KC Capital, is data driven. How are you data driven and where do you get your data from? Yeah, this is the most exciting part of our business. You know, at the end of the day, every great business has something that truly differentiates them from the market. In the traditional private markets today, there is certainly no way to get access to real data on private companies. What do I mean by that? Well, legally, you're not required to disclose anything as a business when you're doing a private market transaction. So you're not going to get your hands on real financials. You're certainly not going to get your hands on real financials in real terms at scale. Now, there are solutions out there like Crunchbase and PitchBook that will essentially tell you, hey, here's how the deal was done, You know what the price was. Who, who partook and how much they raised. 
everything beyond that is self-reported by the company. And anyone you talk to will tell you that the data is really bad beyond kind of the valuations and how much was raised. And so when these firms talk about being data-driven, you kind of want to ask them, what is it? What data are you using? I don't imagine you have any data beyond really the price of the deal. And so what's really exciting about our industry and what we're building at King's Crown is that in order to raise money online in the way that we're talking about, you have to file two years of audited financials, all the terms of the deal. We get to see exactly how much money you're raising via the platforms. And then we take all of that data. And in addition, we go off and we do our own work around market sizing, market growth rates. We dig into the founders and we've built this full quant rating system. It's a comparative quant rating system that looks at all of the deal flow available in the market at any given time and takes in those 300 data points that we collect across their financials, the terms, the market, the founding team, so on and so forth. And we take all those quant data points and they basically go into our algorithm that scores them against one another and spits out an overall score between one and five. So at King's Crowd Capital, we will only invest in companies that are a 4.0 or above. Everything else gets nixed. And the reason we do that is because it really helps to cut out the noise in the market and focus in on those companies that are really, really interesting. So instead of using heuristics, we try and use data around everything we do. So for instance, we're looking at your revenue growth rate. We're looking at your revenue multiple, knowing that those numbers are audited financials and that they're real numbers and that we're looking at 2,000 companies who look like you who also have provided us their financials. So we get to do this at scale, which becomes very, very powerful. No one else is sitting on this data or building these models. And so it puts us in a really uniquely differentiated situation to be able to create something that's truly data-driven in a market that has always relied on heuristics over data. So Chris, this takes us to what everybody is talking about right now, which is AI. Can VCs use AI? Do you use AI in your fund? And are we in an AI bubble? So it's like anything, right? A AI is a very, very powerful tool when applied correctly. At the end of the day, artificial intelligence is only as good as the fuel that you fuel it with, right? So if you put in bad data, you're going to get bad answers out of AI. AI is smart to the point of it knows how to contextualize the data you feed it. If you feed it bad data, it's completely worthless. And, and it, it's kind of ironic to me because if I was a venture capitalist today, the businesses I would actually be investing in is not more AI technology. We, we don't need more AI technology. We need more proprietary data companies that are sitting on exceptional data that can spit out incredible answers when artificial intelligence is applied and can read through that data and provide really valuable answers. So for us, absolutely. I think the future is that we create a multitude of funds across all of the different alternative asset classes that are now being raising capital online and use AI on our data models to suggest which companies we should be in data-driven, AI-powered. And I, I think that is the future. Essentially, the AI will be able to go back and look at all of our data over the many years and say, here was the predictive factors that led these companies to be successful. Now we're going to identify the companies that look like those in your new data set, and we're going to tell you to invest in those. And I, I think that's the world we're moving towards. So if you do this correctly, I absolutely think AI can be very powerful. But if you're just applying it to like your crunch based data, it's not going to be any good. I mean, maybe it'll help you do your search process a little faster to cut through the noise and get to the handful of deals that fit your criteria. But beyond that, I'm not sure it's going to do you a whole lot of good. To your last question, are we in AI bubble? I, I think we've kind of gone through this cycle in, in Silicon Valley and, and really just in the tech ecosystem in general over the past 20 years, which is everyone's just hoping to find the next big thing. I've said it to our team several times over the years, but you know, if you watch CNBC, we're still talking about the FANG stocks today, right? Including Netflix and Google. And it's like, have we had no massive innovative companies since then that can rival those companies in terms of their importance? Everyone's still looking for kind of the, the next FANG, right? Uber, Lyft, all those guys kind of faltered. They, they didn't become exactly what the venture capitalists kind of told us they would become. And so, yeah, everyone's just kind of buying into the next hype cycle, the next hype cycle, the next hype cycle. I do think the market is overheated at the moment. At the same time, of everything that's come out in the last like 10, 15 years, whether it's crypto and the metaverse and Web3, all these things, 
I do think the most legitimized and real opportunity for a very real impact on our country and on the world is artificial intelligence. It's clearly a real technology that has a lot of power. But again, I'm not sure we need to invest in more AI. We might need to invest a lot more in really, really good data. That makes sense. Now we know more about what you do and how you do it. Can you tell us more about the why? Why do this this way? Why not have a regular VC firm? What's wrong with the traditional VC model? Or whether on the startup side or the LP side or the creation side, why? Why are you doing all this, Chris? You know, if you look at returns in the venture markets over the past 20 years, if you look at the decline of companies going public over the past 20 years, what you're seeing is a decline in returns in the venture industry. You're seeing less companies IPO. You're seeing less opportunities for wealth creation amongst all of us in the United States going down as well. And so there's just kind of been this deterioration of what was a very exciting industry within the venture industry back in the late 90s and early 2000s when all the you know best and brightest and most innovative were out in Silicon Valley. And I just think we've seen, unfortunately, a, a real fall off from what it used to be. And there's multiple reasons for that. I think one is, is people have gotten lazy and, and are kind of riding the backs of past success. I think more importantly is from a structural standpoint, the success of early venture firms led lots and lots of firms to enter the space and for the firms that had success to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the math only really works in venture when there's a small pool of capital going to a handful of really exceptional companies. And now what we're seeing is just a plethora of capital chasing not so good deals. And so from my perspective, back in the, like right around 2014, I was working in the private equity industry and I just felt as though as I looked around that this, uh, the structure of the market that exists today was showing cracks and wasn't performing well anymore. And it became a bloated industry that has really high fees and not that great a performance. And I asked the question of, can we do better than this? And so when I saw that this new industry was emerging, that was going to allow anybody to invest. A lot of people said, oh, that's going to lead to negative selection bias. Only bad companies are going to raise from the public, so on and so forth. But in reality, from my perspective, what I saw was the first opportunity for us to create a transparent, open market that would create better competitive pricing, allow the best companies to rise to the top. We were going to create a more efficient market, right? What about the traditional private markets today is efficient? That's one of the big structural issues is there's a lack of efficiency. It's all this hand-to-hand -hand combat, who you know, not what you know. It's not about if you have a great company. It's about if you're connected to the right investors. There's just so many issues with the traditional ecosystem. I thought you have to start completely over from the ground up and build an open, transparent, effective marketplace that would allow people to make better, smarter, wiser decisions. And that transparency component is just so important because, you know, we've seen deals and I won't mention their name, but there was a company that raised $150 million from some of the most notable VCs out there at a $1.6 billion valuation. And they did a community round and I had an opportunity to look at their financials and they had raised that money on a $2 million revenue run rate which is just absolutely flabbergasting, right? That's a 666 times revenue multiple. It was likely the worst deal done in our industry in 2022. And that just speaks to the overvalued nature and, and the, the laziness and sloppiness that I saw in the traditional private market ecosystem. And so we have to do better than that. If you look wait, at the, what happened to that company? Did it succeed? Is it still around? Or I, they're it, still around. I mean, they're okay. very, very well capitalized, so they should have a, a decent runway. But I'll tell you, it's in a crowded category and it's a commoditized product. So I, I don't get it. And the, their only really defensive moat was the fact that they have so much capital to potentially beat their competitors. But that's not the best way of investing in innovation. And if you look at some of the companies that are now raising in our market, in the online private markets, wow, some of these deals are incredible. Uh, I'll tell you, I was looking at a company today and it's basically like toast, but for food trucks. And they had, I think, eight, $10 million in revenue last year. They had grown like 30 or 40% and we're raising at a 4X revenue multiple, which is like unheard of in the venture industry. And you're seeing some of these really exceptional companies say, 
I don't want to raise from venture. I can do this more effectively and efficiently. And so I just love seeing this new pool of capital, this new open transparent market that I believe over the next 10, 20 years can both mainstream this asset class, create more access to private market opportunities that can create real wealth creation in the US for lots and lots of individual Americans. And we can create a better outcome in terms of innovation and economic opportunity in this industry. And so for me, this is the place that you wanna be. This is the forefront of the next wave of innovation and really, really good companies. I think some of the best companies and best deals that will ever be had in our industry are happening right now, right? Because whenever it's the wild, wild west and you're early in a market, that's when the best opportunities come along. Once people realize that opportunities exist in this space, that's when the valuations go up, everything starts to change because people recognize that there's been success there already. Let me push back a little bit. Traditional VCs would say that, no, the market is already efficient, but it goes through cycles. There is more excitement, more competition over good deals that drives valuations up. But then the market every 10 or so years corrects itself and you would see down rounds. What do you say to that? Well, yeah, there's a reason why they're raising down rounds is because they were just so heavily overvalued before. And one could argue that you have this real problem of, again, such large pools of capital chasing so few actually good deals that they just often overpay in a pretty dramatic way. Now, listen, you're always going to have market cycles. And of course, you're going to have periods where valuations are higher, and then they're going to take a nosedive at some point because economies don't grow forever and they do have downturns. But the lack of performance across the venture industry for the last you know, 10, 12 years has been pretty alarming, if you ask me. The, the median return of a venture fund from the 2012, 13 kind of pool portfolios is around 11%, which tells you that the winners, which actually do quite well, right? There's a handful of firms that will do quite well, are really pulling up that 11% number, which tells you that probably most of those funds either returned well less than 11% or didn't return any money at all. And that to me is very concerning. Well, Chris, how do you see the future of this industry in the next five to 10 years based on what we discussed so far and what you see in the market? So I actually think there's something even broader that's going, like we can't just think of this as like private market reinvention, which it is, it is private market reinvention, but this is really capital market reinvention in totality. So what I believe is going to happen over the next 10 to 20 years, and this is a long game, is that people will invest across the private markets and public markets across all asset classes, be it real estate, crypto, collectibles, so on and so forth. They'll be investing across all of these different asset classes right alongside their public company investments. And so it's like you could be investing from pre-seed to large cap stocks, but it'll all be very seamless. You won't think anything of it. You won't imagine a world where you didn't have exposure to the early stage markets in the United States, and you didn't have exposure to commercial real estate in your portfolio. At some point, what's going to happen is there will be both public funds and new age funds that exist that are essentially venture funds across stages, right? So you'll have a NASDAQ 100 of like late stage private companies, and you'll have the NASDAQ 5000 of like really early stage companies, right? And you're going to have all of these different fund products that emerge that become available directly out of your brokerage account. All of the massive asset managers across the United States and probably globally will offer access to alternative investments, both through fund products, as well as being able to make unique individual investments into these direct investment opportunities. And venture funds, I think what will happen is they'll actually start to look a bit more like hedge funds. And the reason I say that is because it's going to create a lot more opportunities for liquidity, both through secondary sales, as well as just having funds that, that are liquid and that trade on different exchanges. And so in the future, I think there's going to be a lot more buying and selling opportunity of private companies. And this whole issue of fewer and fewer private companies actually deciding to go public, well, that'll be solved a bit in that these private companies will be pseudo public. And by that, I mean, their shares will at least be available for sale through secondary marketplaces uh, or primary offerings that they decide to do. And so I think it's just going to create a way more dynamic private capital market 
where, by the way, we could probably support the number of venture funds and things like that that exist out there by scaling our access to deal flow across the entire country, by scaling you know, the ease of being able to invest in a multitude of deals, and by the way, get in and out of those deals in a much more efficient and effective way. So I'm, I'm really excited. I think what we're going to end up with is a very dynamic uh, capital market that involves private markets and public markets becoming really one in a converged way that we've never seen before. Yeah, I would love to live in a future where private markets are more liquid. Many companies have tried to do this before. Some companies are still trying. And there are a lot of uh, marketplaces for private companies today, which is an awesome and amazing uh, thing to have in the private market. Because yeah. There is one other thing I, I just want to mention because I, I think it's really important. When we talk about that market inefficiency, right? I'll, I'll give you another really good example of where we see the market inefficiency. For 20 years, venture capitalists have told us that they were going to solve this issue of, of not backing female founders, right? And only 2% of funding is going to female founders. We need to solve it. We need to solve it. We need to solve it. Well, guess what? It's been 20 years, and we're at the exact same point. It's still 2% of funding for female founders, and dramatically less than that for minority founders. Then if you look at just you know geographic, right? Like Innovation is not limited to Silicon Valley, Boston, and New York, where 90% of venture funding goes. Well, if you look at our ecosystem, right, the online private markets, first off, all 50 states have gotten funding. The Southeast has done quite well. Florida, Louisiana, we've seen a bunch of companies get funded out of those states. So every state has gotten money within the first five years. I don't even think the venture industry has invested in a company in every state yet. Funding for females is about 30%. So it's very clear that if you change the LP base, you'll also be able to change who gets funded. And those are just overlooked opportunities. I mean, I can't tell you how many billion dollar business opportunities exist for female founded companies that venture investors are just not even looking at. And all of the deals that they're not investing in because they won't go and look at a company in Oklahoma or Wisconsin, where maybe that company is dramatically better valued, but they're just not looking at it because they don't think enough to go and look at it because they're only looking at things in their own network that are biased and are maybe incorrectly priced. And so seeing every state get funding, seeing female founders get funded at a dramatically higher rate, seeing minority founders get funded at a dramatically higher rate, I think they're in the 14 or 15% range, which again is not perfect by any means, but it's dramatically higher. It's 10, 20, 100 times better than we're seeing in the traditional market. So that to me is overlooked opportunity with massive upside. And that's the inefficiencies of having your deal flow sourced only from your own network that's always going to be biased and you're going to overlook things. And that's the opportunity that exists in this space. So having automated deal flow from across the country and eventually globally from all these different backgrounds and types of people, man, the types of companies that are going to get built because of that is just astounding. Is there anything that you would like to share with us, but I didn't ask you about? Hmm, That's a great question. I, I think I... Uh, I, I hit on the things that I definitely wanted to mention. I guess one thing to mention is, you know, first off, uh, if you want to invest in King's Crowd Capital, you absolutely still have an opportunity to do that. I can share the link with you so that you can invest uh, in our fund, which is investing in 100 of the highest rated companies using the King's Crowd rating algorithm over the next four years. We've already invested in 20 individual companies. And the idea here is essentially create an outperform index of our industry, which I think is really, really exciting. And it's the first of its kind. And we're already seeing some of our investments perform very, very well there. Or if you want to make those individual investments or start sourcing deal flow from these marketplaces where I think you can find some really exceptional deals, you can go to kingscrowd.com and check out all of the data that we use to make the decisions we do at Kingscrowd Capital. I will share the link in the description of the podcast so anyone can click on the link and either invest directly or invest in the fund. Chris, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for the opportunity, Ahmed.